good to see everybody out here tonight. If you have your Bibles, let's turn over to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, we're going to continue talking about the blessing and these, these busters that tend to steal from us as followers of Jesus. Some of them are some of them are things we can do and some things we can't do. Uh, but at the end of the day, I want to be on the Lord's side. Amen. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, God speaks to Abram here saying, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I have I go childless, and the heir of, the ho- uh, heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but the one who will come from your body shall be your heir. Then, the, then he, that's the Lord, brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven, count the stars, if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he, that's Abram, believed in the Lord, and he, had, and he had counted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to the land, to this land, to inherit it. And, the, and he said, the Lord, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? And he said to me, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. Then he brought him and cut him de- cut him in two down the middle and placed each opposite of the other and he did not cut the birds in two so it goes on and goes on we'll 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 be reminded of this so let's uh, before we continue let's go to the lord in prayer father we love you we glorify you we give you all praise all glory all honor uh, because you're good to us lord and it's your will to bless your people lord god and we receive your blessing tonight um, as we uh, dive into your word lord god give us hearing ears seeing eyes Lord God, hearts ready to receive what you have for us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So here we have Abram. Abram called out of Ur of the Chaldees. Ur, um, Ur, where Abram grew up at, would be in modern-day Iraq, Iran, in the Middle East area. God is searching for a man that he can establish a family, and out of that family would come a tribe, and out of those tribes would come a nation, and out of that nation, all the world, all the world would be blessed. And, and out of all the men on the world, God chose Abram first, who was fatherless. I, as, as you read through Abram's account from Genesis chapter 12 on, I believe this, Abram was likely the first millennial, he was living in his dad's house till he was 70. He didn't have much responsibility, didn't have much going for him, had a wife that, that followed him around. But the guy was just kind of stuck in a place until God called him out and said, hey, let's go on an adventure. Abram, you're fatherless, but I'm going to do something in your life that will change that, transform you, and transform you from Abram to Abraham so that you're from fatherless to the father of many, because we know this, that God is the God who brings change, brings transformation, brings restoration, uh, causes good things to come into our life. And Abram, out of all the gods that he, he grew up, he grew up in Ur, like I said, as a son of an idol maker, and as God's speaking to his heart, he, I can only imagine that Abram's going, which God are you? Are you this God? Or are you that God? It would have been, uh, he, he would have created these little trinkets of all these other gods, but God revealed himself to Abram and called him out of the land that he was living into a promised land. So Abram goes on this journey, and by the time we get over here to Genesis chapter 15, God is telling Abram, like, I am going to bless you. And he gives him these words in Genesis 1. The first word that God is speaking to him in a vision saying, do not be afraid. Anytime God's calling us anywhere outside of our comfort zone to do something different, to be obedient to his calling, our first response nearly 100% of the time is to be afraid. Can you say amen? Because we know our flaws, we know our faults, we know our shortcomings, we know our failures, we know, we know who we are, 
And there's, I believe, a certain part of us that goes like, you know what, I can't do this without God. And my first response is to be afraid. And that's actually probably the right response because we don't want to do things without God's hand. As I've seen other people grow or go on this journey of following Jesus, the ones that have too much pride, that have too much um, hubris, that have too much um, just self-confidence, those are normally the ones that blow in, blow up, and blow out, and they leave this great mess left behind them. And 10 years later, somebody asks, well, whatever happened to so-and-so? Have you had those conversations before? And you go like, well... Like, they loved the Lord. Yeah, they did. And they were really gifted. Yes, they were. And they were anointed. Yep. And they were real passionate. Yes, they were. But their character had not caught up with their anointing. And they they started to go down on a path, and they got a little bit of taste of the anointing, and they thought it was them and not God. And then they're doing it all in their own strength. And whenever I do anything in my own strength, it zaps me. I can't, I'll say this, even, even doing something under the anointing zaps me and makes me exhausted. But when I'm trying to do it all in my own strength, it's like I'm trying to swim uphill, up current, with 50 pounds of weight around my neck. And God's response to Abram is the same response to us when he's calling us out to do something different. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to witness to your friend. Do not be afraid to share the gospel. Do not be afraid uh, to pray for that loved one. Do not be afraid to pray for that coworker. Do not be afraid to stand up for righteousness. Do not be afraid to align ourselves with biblical principles in a culture that's going crazy. Can you say amen? Because our first response is, ah, just be quiet. And God's saying here, Abram, do not be afraid I am your shield. He's our defender. He's our protector. He's he's the one who's quenching the fiery darts of the enemy. He's the one who's standing beside our, on our left and our right, our forward and our rear. He's the one that is there protecting us. I know this. I don't like, there's some things that I'm cool with doing alone. There's a lot of things I don't like doing alone. Can you say amen? amen. I, I don't. I don't like, I was sharing this with the fellas this afternoon, like I, I don't like to do funerals if I don't have a lot of my team members around me. Can you say amen? Yeah. Like it's, it, even, even having the young men help them back on the sound or, or so, having a familiar face, like I, I, want, I want to know I'm in an, an arena where there's somebody else standing in my corner. I don't just want to do it alone. We're not, God did not design us to walk this walk of faith by ourselves. Even as we took communion this last Sunday, we were reminded that that we're one body, that we're one family, that Jesus' body was, was divided so that we could be united so that, so that we could walk together. And when we share a common meal or we share communion, it brings everybody into to one place at one time in one experience. And we partake of the body uh, represented in the, as the or we take, partake of the bread that represents the body of Christ. And we take uh, the juice or, uh, that represents his blood. And we're, all, we're all reflecting on ourselves and, and we, we, it unites us. And it doesn't, it does something for ourselves individually, but it also does something for us corporately. And, and when we're doing something, we are in a corporate body where we, where we live in a life that's interdependent upon other people. One of the things that our men's group were reminded of each and every month um, as men of of mighty men of valor that that we live this Christian life as if the kingdom of God was strengthened or weakened by our commitment or lack thereof. And every time I read that or every time I hear it, I go like, I got a responsibility in this. 
Like, there's a responsibility in my part of, do it, of, of being in the kingdom. And, and whatever God's called me to do is a big responsibility. And I don't have to compare my responsibility to Graham's responsibility. Can you say amen? Or whoever your favorite evangelist is, or author, or speaker. Like, I'm not being compared to them, but I'm being, I'm being held to the standard that God's called me. And for some, the greatest calling that we need to the greatest ministry that we can have is the ministry to our family, the ministry to our friends. Like there's, there's to me, like, there's nothing more precious than a mom or a dad kneeling down before their child as they're going down, laying down for bed and praying with them or praying over them at night or singing worship songs. When, when my kids were little, and I don't sing, but I'll sing to them. This is sing to the Lord, but um, we'd sing worship songs. I don't know a whole lot of lullabies. So, so we sing worship songs. And it was acclimating them, and I'd pray a blessing upon my kids. And even this afternoon, as one of my kiddos had a rough afternoon, and he shared with me something because it was weighing heavy on his heart. I won't go into the details, but it became an opportunity for me to share some things with him on this is how you be a good friend. We, we treat others the way we want to be treated. And if what happened to one of your friends happened to you, how would that make you feel? And what would you do about it? And we're able to process it. Then that becomes ministry to our kids. And no, nobody's going to sit here and write some timers book. It's not going to be some fantabulous edited YouTube video over a conversation like that. But it, hopefully it's a conversation that he remembers for the rest of his life. And it becomes a foundation of the type of friend that he wants to be as he grows. Does that make sense? So our, our calling is, is not just compared with everybody else. But compared to what God called me to do with this other great man, or great woman of God, we just look at ourselves and go, why do you cry? Like I haven't, I, I've preached in... I've actually had the privilege of preaching in three countries. The United States, where we are, great nation in the world. Amen. Love the country. Don't like all our policies, don't like everything that we do, but we're still a great nation because there are great people that live in this nation. And if other people are out there in their nation, they need to think their nation is the greatest nation in the world. And they need to love their country. But at 15 years old, I was able to gospel in El Salvador, 1,500 miles away from my parents. How that was awesome. That was amazing. I grew a whole lot in those 30 days being out of country. But there's one time, one weekend, we were able to do what we called our, our excursion journey, or we went out into the, to the field. We weren't just ministering in the main city, but we went to a city called a wash upon. I remember it vibrantly. A couple things I remember about that trip was we stayed in an old rundown school, was where we where our team hunkered down at. The there was no running plumbing. What we had were holes cut in floors. Um, we had one meal that had to last us like two days. Um, and it's, it's, it was like chicken and rice, but it was like more like chicken-flavored water and rice. And, uh, and while we were out there, um, I got a chance to, to, we presented our drama to this uh, on a military base. And we're talking young Salvadoran military guys and uh, had a chance to go boldly and share the gospel with this, uh, it would have been their equivalent of their army. But on one particular afternoon, our team leader was able to get us to go over to Guatemala, like covertly, like just cross the border. We had no visas. We had no permission to be in Guatemala. Here we are, 30 American teenagers from 13 years old to 20 years old, walking across this bridge into Guatemala. And we got to minister in Guatemala, too. So three countries. What if I compare that with someone else? who's done 100 plus countries, I go, oh, what have I done? And then there's probably someone out there going, I've never been out of Kansas. 
And it's okay because whatever God's called us to do, we need to be obedient to that calling and fulfill it 100%. And Abram's being reminded by God, Abram, do not be afraid. I'm your shield, your exceedingly great reward. That means God becomes the source of his blessing. Abraham wasn't chosen because he was good. He was chosen because God is good. Can you say amen? amen. And God knew that Abram would be obedient. And, and Abram goes into dialogue the same way that we go into dialogue and go, God, I, how can this be? You want me to be a father of many nations? I don't have a descendant. All I got is this secondary servant in the house who's now the most important one. And God's reminding him, like, that's not the one. Quit seeing things the way you naturally see them because I'm going to let you see things differently. In verse 4, it says, Then the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside, gave him a picture, and said, Look now toward the heaven. Count the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to them, so shall your descendants be. And since we live in, most of us live in the city and we get so much light pollution, it's really, when you look at the night sky in your backyard, it's not the night sky that you should be seeing. That if you go to a dark place and then you really look at the night sky, you'll see, see things that you can't see while you're living in town. And you start seeing the Milky Way as it scattered across the sky. And you go, those are the same stars that Abram was looking at. And his attempt to count them was futile because he couldn't do it. And God will give us images and pictures, too, of the blessing that he wants to give in our lives. And verse 6, love this verse. And he, that's Abram, he did what? He believed God. He believed in the Lord. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. He believed in the Lord. And this, this it seems so basic and so simple that we somehow have to make it complicated in how we believe God. And I found out just in my years of walking with the Lord, the way I believe him is that where he goes, I follow. That when there's a cloud, he's a cloud by day, he's a fire by night. When he's moving, I'm following. And in, in our probably in Exodus, we're given a cloud by day, fire by night. In the New Testament, we're given torches and voices. Then in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit descended upon the church, and the Holy Spirit set tongues of flame over each and every one. If you look in the Greek of it, it's talking about torches and voices, is it not, Pastor? And it's the exact same words in the Greek that if they use them in the Hebrew, that shared in the book of Exodus when it's talking about lightnings and thunderings. <laughs> I do have a good memory. <laughs> a cloud by day and a fire by night. So instead of us being led by some apparition in the sky of a cloud or a fire, what we're led is by this Holy Spirit of God that dwells inside our hearts. And he's still speaking to us today. And he'll give us torches and voices to follow us, or for us to follow him. Can you say amen? And there, it's... it's it's present. So how do we how do we do? We believe God, and when we believe God, it's accounted to us for righteousness. Similar, everything everything that we're doing as followers of Jesus, it is a faith walk. Like you guys say this all the time, because we need reminded of it all the time. Everything we live by faith, we walk by faith, walk by faith, not by sight. The just shall live by faith. Faith is our confession. Can you say amen? These are all parts of, and when we're walking in faith, we're believing God. And even when I don't, even when I cannot see the outcome, when I can't see past 
this certain point, I still have to believe God. And the Word of God tells us in Psalm 119 that thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. That at a minimum, God's given me enough revelation in this Word to take the next step. Can you say amen? amen. And sometimes as we're walking with God, that's all he's going to show us. It, that, we don't... As we read this part of Abram's account, we don't see God going into every single detail of Abram's life and going, now, Abram, you're going to go, you're going you're to go past the land that I called you, you're going to go into Egypt, and you're going to lie about being married to your wife, and you're going to say that she's your sister, and then there's going to be this Hagar and Ishmael thing, and you should really avoid that and going into, oh, there's going to be a time where you're going into battle, and then you're going to go have, uh, you're going to go have communion with Melchizedek. And, and we don't see God giving him the whole story. What we see is going, Abram, I call it you to be the father of many nations. I'm your shield. I'm your exceedingly great reward. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And as, we read, as you read through Genesis, even in your own time, we're flipping to it. and We're reading Genesis. We're reading three or four chapters of Genesis in 10 or 15 minutes, and we're just thinking it's like the scenes of a movie, and it's just playing over scene one, scene two, like it's happening super fast. Abram's walk with God developed over decades. And it wasn't as if we don't have any account of it in Scripture that tells us that God was sharing that God was sharing this with Abram every single day, do we, Pastor? It'd be like just popping in and going, "Remember Abraham? This is what I told you." And then he's, "Okay, I'm going to move here, tent. We're going to chill over in this area of the world." And then ten years later, God shows, and we're just thinking, "Oh, this it's took me fifty. It took me fifteen minutes. It could have been." It could have been like a week. It could have been years between times of God speaking to Abraham. And I'll say this even for myself, like if I'm not hearing from God on a regular basis, I get nervous. Can you say amen? Like I want to know, I want to know what God's speaking. Because I, I want to know what he's speaking to me. I want to know what he's speaking about our country. I want to know what he's in my heart so that I can serve the people that God's called me to serve. And if he's not speaking, I'm going like, God, what's up? I thought I was your guy. Like, you called me to this. And sometimes it's going, you know what? He's going to give you enough. He's going to give you enough that you take the next step because you still have to trust me. And if I showed you the totality of the plan that I have for you, you would mess it up and you would try to do it with your own strength and you would try to figure everything out and you would... God's going God's to show us the revelation that he has for our lives in bits and pieces. Here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. Because at the end of the day, we still have to trust him. And the same faith that Abram believed in God and was accounted to him for righteousness is the same faith that we put in the grace of God and the mercy of God or salvation. Can you say amen? Abraham believed God and he believed in a Messiah that was to come and Abram's in heaven right now. As he believed in Jesus who was to come. He believed in Jesus who has already come and that became the source of our salvation. So that's the, and I know pastor's got a message on the blessing of Abraham that he didn't go into much more granular details. But we find out this as we're reading in in Genesis chapter 15, that after God speaks, the first, the next thing that Abraham does is he builds an altar of worship, and then he makes a sacrifice. And how important in our own lives is to dedicate a place to the Lord and worship him in that location. Uh, an altar, we have altars here, and we don't use them very often, but altars a special place. Can you say amen? amen. They, they, they become our minds because of how God's designed them. Oftentimes we need this physical, tangible location that we connect a, a specific moment to. And that altar becomes that place. Can you say amen? amen? 
there's and Abraham establishes this altar and what he does at the altar, what we do at the altar, what we're supposed to do at the altar is worship and sacrifice. Worship and sacrifice. We offer up a sacrifice of praise. And any time there's a sacrifice that's mentioned, uh, I'd like to think of it this way, that it cost someone something. Can you say amen? amen. If, if it doesn't cost us anything, it's not a sacrifice. If it doesn't cost us our time, our energy, our resources, pride, if it doesn't cost us anything, it's not really a sacrifice. Every single sacrifice comes with a cost. And we see in Abraham's sacrifice, he had multiple levels of sacrifice. And there were different types of sacrifices. But even as Jesus was being brought to the temple, as his mom and dad were bringing him into the temple, they didn't have much for a sacrifice, so we know they brought two turtle doves. Because that was their sacrifice. And their sacrifice becomes what God's called him to sacrifice, our sacrifice. Christ is what God's called us to sacrifice. Can you say amen? Every, it's, and the sacrifice it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 4 with the story of Cain and Abel. Sacrifice is an act of faith. And it's, find the right words to say here. It's giving up something today because there's a better promise that's on in store for tomorrow. And we make sacrifices today so we can have a blessing to come for us in the future. And those that consume all those that consume everything for today have nothing to give the Lord for sacrifice and therefore they Make sure I'm choosing my words right here. If we don't sacrifice something today, we're actually sacrificing the blessing of tomorrow. Is, am I, is that making sense? <laughs> it's, because there's, there's, what's that? There, there's, a, there's a now sacrifice for a tomorrow blessing. That's a better way to say it. Hallelujah. So blessing of Abraham. So what causes these blessings to um, get busted in our lives? We talked, o- we talked over several of them over these last months. I'll just recap a few of them. Disobedience to the Lord. We talked in 1 Samuel chapter 15 where Saul, King Saul, um, uh, was disobedient to the Lord. And it cost him not only his... Uh, not only the lineage of of his family being king, but it cost him his kingdom. I mean, as we talked a few weeks ago about mismanagement and poor stewardship. Number three, we talked about being double-minded. Um, number four, here a few weeks ago, we talked about not being under authority. Last week and last week we talked about lack of knowledge and wrong motivation, how they steal the blessing from our lives. And tonight, we'll kind of lean into this, and we'll see how far we get into this. It's uncontrolled confession. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4 and 14 says this, Seeing then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Seeing that then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. 
For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. In verse 16, it says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in our time of need. There's something about holding fast to our confession. This word, hold fast, in the Greek, we've talked about it a lot. Pastor Jim and I pronounce it differently, but uh, I'll give you the Greek. It's kederko. It means, I'm, pronoun- I'm pronouncing it the way I pronounce it. That's the way I do. It means to hold fast. What it means is to grab a hold of and don't let go for any reason at all. It, it, in, a, in a modern vernacular, we use this. It's like the football player who's having the Hail Mary thrown at them into the end zone. They're jumping up for the ball. They're grabbing a hold of it. And no matter what the defender does, they are, they are not going to drop that ball. They're going to score the touchdown, win the game. Young man over here used to wrestle. And one thing you wanted to do, you wanted to be the first one to grab a hold of the guy, didn't you? And you wanted to control you wanted to impose your will on his body by grabbing a hold of him and not letting him go. Is that? I wasn't a wrestler, but I know. I watched enough WWE through the years, and I know <laughs> that's the way you're supposed to do it, right? Then you give him a DDT, and it's over. But, <laughs> but, but, anyway, but the thing is, is like, if you're going to win, you're going to have to hold on to the guy. Because if you don't hold on to him, you can't pin him. And there's things in our own life where if we don't hold on to things and we let them go, it's not ours anymore. Let us hold fast to the confession of hope without for he promised is faithful. Uh, in, in the book of Revelations, God pronounces a special blessing upon those that hold fast to what God has, has promised them. Who don't let go, who maintain it, who, who keep, keep their and tried and true with the word of God. Can you say amen? amen. And we, we can goof things up. Let me say this. That when we're talking about confession, profession, people take it in. It's like people want to gravitate between two extremes. And they either want to get foolish with their confession to where it's, it's just bizarre that they're monitoring things to that level I, we need to be careful with our words. Can you say amen? amen. We, need to, we need to use the right words for the right situations. As followers of Jesus, pronounce words of blessings. We bless people. We don't curse people. They're good words and they're bad words. It's all in there. But sometimes people get bonkers on this confession side to the extreme. They irritate me. They irritate me. It's like, ah. Oh. Give me a break. You're just, it, it's like we got, we're living, we're living life, folks. We're living life. And then you got others that are like completely rejecting confession as being important at all. And they reject it in two ways. They either, they either devalue it and say it's, and say, well, it really doesn't matter because in their mind they go, well, God's sovereign and God's going to do what God's going to do. And it really doesn't matter what you say, it's the way it's going to be. We'll talk about some other scriptures that debunk that. Or, they're ones that just say dumb stuff all the time. Can you say amen? Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, like, I'm not going to go around and go, this job is killing me. Why? Because there are some times that it could kill. But I've also know this, the job that I work with full time at during the day, we've had multiple people, we've had at least two or three people die every year for the last four or five years. Maybe it wasn't the job that was killing them, but maybe it was lifestyle that was associated with it. But there's some things I just, I don't, there's things I don't want to say. Because at the end of the day, our words, our words at the end of the day are containers of thoughts. Can you say amen? They're, they're, they, they mean something to somebody. That's the whole reason we can even have a conversation or even preach the word is through the words that we share. And, and 
thoughts have intentions and motivations and at, and also not only do they become containers of thoughts but our words become seeds that we sow and we can either sow to the flesh or we can sow to the spirit but at the end of the day god's not mocked according to galatians whatsoever man sows that will he also reap so our words, our words, I believe, our words are powerful. They're one of the most powerful things we have available to us as followers of Jesus. Yes, and we talked here a few weeks ago on Sunday morning about the power of the tongue and how one small spark can ignite such a great flame. And I've seen it happen in my own life. I've seen it happen in the lives of other people. And not and mismanaging our confession. I'm not saying the goofiness that other people um, go out that do where they're driving down the street and they're just claiming this car and that's going to be my house. And that's going to be like maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But I'm not like what I'm confessing. And this is the way this is the way you keep your heart right with confessing. When you're confessing, confess the word of God. Can you say Amen. That becomes, that becomes a more sure word of prophecy. And that's going to keep us in line with what God's promises are. And I want to know what God's will is for my life. And not only for my life, but the life of my kids, the life of my marriage. Can you say amen? amen. Like, I don't, want to, I, don't want to say, I don't want to say bad things about the place that I'm working at. I've watched people literally talk themselves out of jobs because of the words they said about their job. <laughs> the words, the words that we share to the about and the to and about the most important people in our life, they mean something. Can you say amen? Yes, amen. Like I, I know this. My wife has a steel trap for a memory. Like she remembers conversations we had in our first year of marriage, and she'll remind me of them. So I, I think it's a wife thing, and like for me, like I don't know what we talked about last week. <laughs> I, we, we survived last week but, but the thing is 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 people remember they don't only they don't only just remember the words that we said but we, they remember the way the words made them feel it and it cuts to the heart can you say amen and even had and we've all experienced that over and over again. We've, we've had the words where somebody's cut us down and made us feel smaller than small. Like all we want to do is go into the corner and hide. At the same time, we've also had people give us words of encouragement that built us up and made us feel like we could run through a troop and leap over a wall. That we, not... And if we weren't going to leap over the wall, we we're at least going to run through the wall. Like they're like, you get a good coach that knows how to use words of motivation. Like it, Pastor Al seen it. Like you can get people to do some wild things with the right words, can't you? I, I watch these young guys that are up here um, in their marching band, and you have a hundred and hundred and sixty kids, hundred and sixty kids from the age of. 14 to 18. And they're following every single instruction the very first time that it's given to them. And when they say march this way, they all march this way. When they say march this way, they all march that way. And they're following directions and words. And then when they come over to my house, I tell them to pick up their shoes. And they won't do it at all. But, but for whatever reason, the band director has got them motivated to respond to the words. So, and because they have a goal of, of putting on a good performance and working together as a unit, how, what would it be if the word of God motivated us similarly? When the word was spoken into us, we just we followed it. But, but confession becomes some, something, I believe it's something that becomes essential to the Christian life of how we monitor the Proverbs tells us that life, you know, let me, yeah, it's Proverbs, Proverbs, I'll quote this scripture, Proverbs 18 and 21. Turn over there. I want you to see it. Proverbs 18, 21.
Proverbs 18, 21 says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. Life and death, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruits. God's putting such weight in the words that we say that we can cause a blessing, we can cause a cursing, we can cause life, or we can cause death. And I've been in enough places where, where I've spoken the wrong word at the wrong time in the wrong way to the wrong people, and it always comes back and bites me over and over. If I shared this here a few weeks ago. If there's one thing that gets me in trouble more than anything else in life, it's not the way I manage money. It's not... Um, it's not the way I raise my kids or treat my wife. It's not the way I um, do my work at my office. If there's one thing that gets me in trouble more than anything, it's the words I say and how I say them. Most of the time, it's more even how I say the words than what I'm saying. But it's like all these things, and they, they become a seed here, a seed here, a seed here, a seed here, and we just think it's all, it's just one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing. But if enough of those confessions are made over time, eventually there's a harvest, and somebody has to pay the piper. Can you say amen? The, the, the great thing is about confession is just as much as it can be used in the negative, it can be used to transform in the positive. And I know this through some of the research that I've done, like like they've, they've done a accounting of it is like it takes like 10 positive things to counterbalance one negative thing is that not fairly accurate sister kim it depends, it depends upon the relationship <laughs> serious 21 okay so we're anywhere from 1 to 10 to 1 to 20 a one negative interaction requires 20 positive interactions. And in fact, there's some studies that, that I know Kim's familiar with as well, is that they can, they can monitor the interactions between a husband and wife and count the positive interactions and negative interactions and predict the probability of divorce to over 85%. Based on the positive interactions and the negative interactions. And don't tell me those things don't add up over time, because they do. But I'll also say this, when you're, when you're doing the positives, you're making deposits that'll become a blessing for the future. Because you want, we want people in our lives that we've made deposits in so that when we're, when we're in need, when we're dependent upon somebody, there's gonna be somebody there to stand beside us someone there to lift us up, someone there that's not going to abandon us. And the words that we say have a big influence on how those relationships develop. <sighs> Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14. Let's turn over there. Philippians 2 and 14. Let me find Philippians. I should find it really quick before Colossians. Philippians 2 and 14, the Apostle Paul writes this, Do all things without complaining and disputing. It's pretty straight and to the point there. <laughs> Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. We don't have to do everything kicking and screaming and doing things the hard way. Can you say amen? And there's... I'll say this too, well, if any of the kids are out there listening, sometimes you just need to do the dishes without complaining about it. Sometimes you just need, 
some of you older guys that are still living at home. Sometimes you just need to grab the vacuum cleaner and go, oh, why do I got to do this all the time? Sometimes when we're at work, we just need to do what we're asked to do. And we don't have to, preaching to myself a lot. We don't have to go on this long inner dialogue of justifying everything. Sometimes we just need to do something without complaining because it's the right thing to do and we need to do it without disputing. I like to argue, and I'm getting better at it than I used to. Pastor Jim's going, eh. <laughs> I don't. I find myself just part of it. Part of it for me is like I got, I know that there's, some, there's a kernel of truth somewhere. I don't want to find the kernel of truth. <laughs> and and I got, we got to go on this journey to find this kernel of truth. And I'm not saying I'm doing this for all the right. I want to do it for the right reasons, but sometimes it comes out wrong. And sometimes for me, I just need to just hit the button because that's what I'm asked to do is hit the button and not complain and not. Sometimes I just need to take out the trash because my wife asked me to take out the trash. Sometimes I just need to do this without murmuring, without complaining, and just live my life. But there's so many things that we're doing, th going through life where it is just friction on every moment. And let me say this, those that live in constant conflict, they're taking years off their lives. Because not, and I know some of y'all know these people, some people like this too, like everything is a fight. Everything is like, it is just like, they have to win at everything. If you say the sky is blue, they're going to fight you to say that it's green because it was green at one moment when, during when the sun was like, they're, they're just ready to fight on it. And it's like, I don't deal well with those people. It, it, even though I like to find the truth, that when, when it gets like that, I just avoid it because I don't have time for that. And not everything has to be a fight. We don't have to. I remind my kids this all the time, like, would you guys all agree that life can be hard sometimes? Well, life can be hard. You can do the very best you can. Live out the blessings that God has for us. Obey his word. Write confession. Sow the right seeds. Do, do everything we can to position ourselves the right way. And still, sometimes life is hard. And the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. And sometimes things break down. And there's sometimes the hot water heater just runs. Some, sometimes the water heater goes out. Uh, like it stinks because it never goes out at the right time. It always goes out like 9 o'clock on a Saturday night when nobody's taken a shower yet. And you're thinking about going to church the next day. But you're kind of nervous because you know what you're going to smell like when you go to church. And we're supposed to offer up a sweet-smelling aroma, not what we have. <laughs> and then you can't get to the next day until like 10 o'clock, and you realize that hot water heaters went from when 15 years ago when you used to put them in, they were $200, and now they're four or $500. And you're going through your, like it doesn't go out at the convenient time. It goes out like right after you put on tires and brakes. <laughs> it's not when you have like this extra money floating around. Can you say amen? amen. Like, it's like, but God, I did everything right. And he goes, yeah, you have. And how much more catastrophic would life be if you weren't doing it right? So there's going to be things that just happen in our lives that we can't control. But because life can be hard, let's not do things that make life harder. And I remind my kids that all the time. It's like, quit doing things that make life harder. Like, turn your homework in on time. Because when you don't, it makes life harder. If, if you're going down to blow all your savings down at the quick shop on candy bars and Mountain Dew, you're making life harder. Um, if, you, if you don't treat your friends right, you're not a good friend. You're making life harder. Because if, you do, if you're not a good friend, then you're going to have no friends. And you don't want to go through life without friends. 
I mean, they, they, they become simple little concepts, but they have you know, significant impact in our lives. And it all starts sometimes in, when we get in this mode of where we're always complaining, you're always disputing. Like, I'm getting ready. This is going to be, this is where I'm going to be tested this week. I know it. I'm flying out with my extended family to Florida Friday morning at 6 o'clock in the morning, which means the Dilbeck family is getting up at 3.30 Friday morning, all loaded up to fly. <sighs> there is going to be opportunity to complain, and there's going to be opportunity to dispute. And there's going to be five of us. Not only is there going to be five Dilbecks, but there's going to be a 10 other family members flying with. We're going, praise God, we're blessed. Count it as a blessing. We're going to Florida for the week. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have a great family time. So if you don't see me Sunday or next Wednesday, it's because I'm on vacation. If I don't return your text or email quickly, it's because I'm at the beach in the ocean wearing a hat, SPF 70, and a long sleeve shirt on. And my legs are going to be underneath the water. So I'm going to, hopefully I'm coming back just as white as I am right now without significant sunburn. Um, but there's going to be opportunity to complain and dispute. Last time I flew, I was flying back uh, with a coworker, and we sat at the, at the uh, exit row. I always like to sit at the exit row. And the stewardess comes over, and it, this had been like a week-long conference at work. I was tired, ready to get home. I was over it. And then the stewardess is asking, whenever you're sitting in the exit row, they go, are you willing to assist in the event of emergency? And normally my response is, yes. and I just leave it at that. At that moment, I was cranky, I was tired, I was irritated. I'd already sat long enough on the tarmac. It was time to fly. And I just told the stewardess, I don't know. <laughs> and she looks at me like, huh? I, I just said, I don't know. Not quite that forceful. It's like, well, if you don't know, we're going to have to move you. And then I look at the other seats and it has 75% less leg room. And when you're on a flight, you want leg room, no matter how long your legs are. <laughs> and then I just said, yes, I will, I will help. That was my moment on flight, and I'm not a big fan of TSA, and I'm not a big fan of them x-raying everything and doing it. I understand that they feel it's necessary. But what I need to do as I go through this next week is I need to go through this vacation without complaining, without arguing, without having to be right, and just go with the flow and just pay for whatever everybody else needs. That's what I want to do. So I'm going to be challenged, and I hope some of y'all are challenged in it too this week. <laughs> but, but it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun, but I'm going to be ready to get home. How, what time we got here? 56, last scripture. Romans 13, verse 13. We'll close with this scripture. Actually, maybe we'll get two. Romans 13, 13. Romans 13, 13, Apostle Paul writes this, Let us walk properly, as in the day, not in revelry or drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. We're, we're living in a culture, even in certain Christian culture today, where it's almost celebrated to be in revelry and drunkenness. Can you say amen? amen? Where people are exploiting their freedom. And just because, just because something isn't condemned explicitly in, in certain areas doesn't mean we need to take it to the lasciviousness. Can you say amen? amen. And, and if there's er Christians need to display strength in areas because there are people that have weaknesses in areas. 
And just because somebody may have a strength in an area and it doesn't bother you or convict your conscience doesn't mean that we have the doesn't justify us flaunting our strength in light of somebody else's weakness. And it's not right to be living in revelry. What's revelry? Not like no care. Like no care, party atmosphere. We're just partying all the time, partying till Jesus comes. No. We're to work until Jesus comes. We're to build the kingdom. And there's going to be time for partying. And it doesn't mean it's all doldrums all the time. But we're not living in this carefree party like it's 1999 just because it's the end of the world and we don't got to. Like, no, if the world, since the world's ending soon, we need to get, we need to get some work done. Can you say amen? And living in drunkenness, like, like it is not cool for Christians to flaunt their drunkenness. Can you say amen? amen. It's, what's that? Oh, it's, it's, be ye not drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, it, it's, it's. Because it leads, it leads to other things. Not in lewdness and lust. Can you say amen? It's not, it's not cool. We should live properly. Not, and then it goes on and he says, not in strife and envy. See, because it, it, as we're reading through this, it's real easy for sometimes when we've walked with the Lord for a while, we go, ah, that's everybody else. That's someone else. No, don't have a problem with revelry, no problem with drunkenness, not lewdness, not lust. And then we get to strife and envy. And we go, oh, I'm to endeavor to keep a unity of the Spirit and a bond of peace. Oh, that means I need, I need, to, give somebody, I need to cut somebody else some slack because they've cut me some slack sometimes. Maybe I shouldn't hold somebody else to a standard higher than what I'd hold myself to. I mean, those are all things that happen within the church. And when strife enters in, then division. Because strife, as soon as strife enters in, then people start striving. And when they start comparing, then they start dividing. And when it starts dividing, then somebody's got to start picking sides. And at the end of the day, no one wins. Can you say amen? And we got to search our own hearts first. And then at verse 14, the Apostle Paul seals that thought with, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That God is love. Can you say amen? amen? That he came as the humble suffering servant. That he gave the ultimate sacrifice. That when he taught us to pray, he taught us our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yes, that he went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil that he had compassion on those he had compassion with. He, he ministered to the least of these. He, he went out of his way to minister to a Samaritan woman in midday at the well, that he wasn't scared of lepers, that he wasn't put off by the crowds, that he also didn't tolerate religious devils. Jesus was most pointed with those uh, of Sadducees and Pharisees who had a conception of God, but they'd lost the spirit of God in their own life. We're to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. If you read the book of Colossians, I encourage you to read Colossians. A, a significant portion in Colossians is the Apostle Paul reminding us that we're to put off these things so we can put on Christ. That even as, even as we prepared tonight and I was getting ready for my day, I put off clothes that I wore last night so I could put on the ones that I'm wearing tonight. You can't, you can't be dressed double. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. So our words, our words become powerful. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And I want to speak words of life. I want to speak words that encourage. I want to speak words that build up and don't tear down. I want to... I want to speak words that promote unity and not cause division. I want, I want to speak words that contain a blessing and not a cursing. I want to see lives and destinies shaped and changed because of words that are shared.
And sometimes the most powerful words that we can share is I love you and I'm here for you. I love you and I'm here for you. And we love you and we're here for you. Pastor, you want to close us in prayer, please?